Now, our first panel this morning is going to look at Indigenous Australia in the 21st century. Indigenous Australia, the world's oldest continuous living culture, which is a source of pride to so many of us. At the Commission, Social Justice Commissioner June Oscar is heading the Wiyuni Udunguni on or Women's Voices Project. This project, which is groundbreaking, has seen June Oscar and her team travelling around the country for the past year and a half. And in doing so, speaking to women and to, to, and to girls in the Indigenous community and consistently they have, they have been impressed by their strength and by their resilience. So before we go to the panel, we have a short video highlighting their work. Well, it's an honour to be able to call this national project of engagement with women, uh, We Yani Udangani, which is uh, Voices of Women in my language, Bunaba. Coming from Fitzroy Crossing and, and leading the women's organisation as the CEO for 12 years, there are some fantastic insights that Fitzroy could offer into this process and share with the other women um, in and across the community uh, that we visited. It was important for the women in the community to have access to this national engagement process, to be able to be included, to be able to share of their experiences, their achievements, and their ongoing challenges. This process will enable voices of women, including the Torres Strait, homeland Torres Strait Islanders, to be up there. And so this is what we would like to see for our future. This is what, what we value. This is what's important to making our communities better and importantly for our kids. Whilst there's difficulties and challenges in our daily lives, we have to find room to celebrate the strengths. And so hearing the songs about life here and what's important was very important for us. And um, I carry that as I leave here today. Take those songs and remember the smiles and the laughter and the singing. to acknowledge the Indigenous women and girls of this country, that they are important, that they have a right to their voice, that people have an obligation and responsibility to hear from them of their priorities and to act on what those priorities are as identified by Indigenous women and girls. If the Australian government is really serious about, you know, when you endorse a an amazing woman to head up the Social Justice Commission of Australia and she's done something like bringing the gatherings of women all across you know in all our regions there's something to be said about that and the, and people's inputs I think was so important and I, I'm pretty sure the common thread amongst all of it was we're here we've got something to say we're going to share it and we're passing it over to our um, our commissioner who's going to support us and endorse it and the government here instead of just hearing from those little little groups here and there this is a mass there's a mob of us yeah Now, you will have noticed um, how gorgeous the stills and the photography um, in this video were. And they're done by one of Australia's leading Indigenous photographers. His name is Wayne Quillam. <clears throat> and some of his other work is outside on the easels there. So as you're milling about having a morning tea, make sure to check them out. Now to our first panel, Advance Australia Where? Indigenous Australia in the 21st Century. And I'd like to welcome to the stage Gamilaro Woman, Channel 9 journalist and moderator for the discussion, Brooke Boney. I was very disappointed when she left the ABC, but we'll put that behind us now. <laughs> She's fabulous. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> She's joined by Northern Territory Treaty Commissioner, Professor Mick Dodson, who is a member of the Yaru people. Welcome to you. 
lawyer, human rights advocate and activist Teela Reid, who's a proud Wiradjuri and Wailwan woman. Welcome to you. <laughs> and finally, Helen Milroy. She's professor of child psychology at the University of WA. <laughs> and over to you, Brooke. for coming today. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the Gadigal people as a Gamilaroi and Gomoroi woman. And I'd also like to thank my fellow panellists here for joining me here today. We're going to speak for about 40 minutes and then uh, we'll open it up to questions. So please go to slido.com and use the hashtag free and equal 2019 at any time during the discussion to submit your questions. Uh, but first, I'd like to invite each of the panel members to uh, say some introductory words. Nick. Um, good morning. <laughs> Very good introductory words. I would um, also join in uh, thanking Chika Madden, Madden for the work on the country and pay my respects to uh, the Gadigal people and all the peoples of the Uluru Nations. It's good to be on our ancestral land. Um, we have a number of questions in the program that we're meant to ask. I, um, for the time being, uh, am the Northern Territory Treaty Commissioner. Uh, so my focus is going to be in that direction, I guess. Um, but it's essential, I think, from um, that we very early in the treaty process ensure that we set standards uh, that are recognised at the international United Nations um, level, legal standards I'm talking about, human rights standards, both for... Uh, dealing with the past, or what I'd prefer to call it truth-telling, um, and for framing the future. We need national standards um, that are already there for the plucking on the international tree of human rights. Excellent. I'm sure we'll have a lot to cover off about treaty today. Teela, would you like to introduce yourself? Yama, Mangdang Guru. Hello, thank you all for coming. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to uh, the owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, I guess by way of opening, uh, I come from uh, an activist background. Um, for the past two years, I have traversed the country uh, advocating for the reforms within the Uluru Statement from the heart. And just to follow on from Professor Crouch's um, introduction, um, I, I see the reforms within the Uluru Statement, for example, uh, constitutionally enshrined First Nations voice and treaty or a Makarata Commission, um, as building the framework for an on honest conversation around human rights between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and, and non-Indigenous Australia. Um, so, yeah, my role, I'm a lawyer by day, but, um, but I have taken my activism very seriously. I do think that uh, this is something that has to be people-powered. Um, it has to be a movement of the people. In the past two years since the Uluru Statement was issued to the Australian people, there's virtually been no funding for the movement, but, but there has been a groundswell of people from all political spectrums. Um, and I think we have to have faith that it will be a people-powered movement that will get us there um, and indeed win the referendum that we need to have this ongoing conversation around human rights. Thank you, Taylor. Professor Milroy? Good morning, everyone. Um, 
Oh, that was loud, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, it's really great to be here. This is a bit of a foreign audience for me. I'm a psychiatrist by trade, child psychiatrist. I'm used to the mental health mob, so I do feel like I'm in a bit of a foreign land, so I was very grateful for the welcome as a country because that does make me feel welcome over this side. I'm from Perth, although my mob are from the Pilbara region. Uh, we're Palku people. Um, so if I do fall asleep, it's because I'm still meant to be asleep at this time of the day. Um, but like I think human rights is a really important issue and I just want to take up the point that was mentioned this morning that every child should be born free. What, what does that mean? Uh, having been a child psychiatrist, having worked in trauma for a very long time, having been on the Royal Commission for Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, I'm not sure that we can say that yet. Mm. I think our children are born into a, an unresolved historical legacy that has generations <coughs> of historical trauma and a disputed landscape. So I think we're a long way off before we can say we're truly born free. And I'd really like to see how that conversation progresses over the next while. Um, I don't think we've understood magnitude. I don't think we've understood what's necessary for healing and for reconciliation. And it's time we took a really big breath and thought about what's going to be required to safeguard the future for our children and beyond. If we lose our Aboriginal kids here, we lose them to the world. And let's face it, we've got the oldest knowledge system in the world, aren't we proud of that? Don't we want to take that forward? That makes us world leaders. Very excellent point. And we're going to cover off a whole range of topics today. Uh, but I'd like to start with treaty. So um, Professor Mick Dodson will start with you. I don't know whether to call you Uncle Mick, Prof, Dodds. You know, I, you, I'm very good friends with your daughter, so we'll, we'll stick to the formalities, I think. What role do you see for treaties as part of the reconciliation process, as part of the recognition process? And um, what are we learning from the processes thus far? Um. No, treaties have the potential to finally fix the relationship between our colonisers and us, um, something that should have been done um, 234 years ago. There are two aspects to treaties, and both of, both of them have potential to contribute to reconciliation, although in the Northern Territory we're rarely using the term reconciliation. Um, there are two aspects, as I say, we need to deal with the past. Um, what happened, uh, people from a foreign country came here uh, in 1770. Uh, and purported to take possession of the whole eastern coast of Australia uh, without the consent or permission of the people who owned it. Then they came back uh, 18 years later with fleets of ships and invaded the place. They didn't um, seek consent, in, although that's what they were ordered to do. Um, they declared that there was no one here who could own the land uh, and proceeded to invade the place and colonise the country, uh, dispossess people, uh, murder, rape and pillage, uh, attempted to, over the period of 230 years, 34 years plus, um, to destroy culture, to destroy language, to destroy families, to destroy nations. Um, the colonial project uh, ambition was to destroy us as a people. Um, and uh, one of the other ways, terrible ways they, they did it was to take our children away. And all of what they done, uh, they've done um, from the very beginning was illegal. Um, and we now have a, I don't know, uh, I, I don't claim that I'm a, 
um, very good constitutional lawyer. But as a, a constitutional lawyer, uh, as, as a lawyer looking at the constitution, um, what's the foundation of white Australia, the colonisers of Australia, what's the foundation of their sovereignty post Mabo? Um, is it just now a sovereignty that's upheld by sheer force because of the federal parliament that controls the military? Or what is it? You know, is it settlement? Well, if it's settlement, why isn't there a treaty or treaties according to their law, not ours, according to their law? Um, terrible things have been done. We've got to redress those things. Mm. That's why truth telling is so, so important. You know, the last massacre, you know, estimates are up to 300 people and some others, some people say it's even higher. But the last massacre of Aboriginal people happened in the Northern Territory where I'm treated to this day. And that happened in 1929. It's not that long ago, it's less than 100 years ago. Yeah. It's not some distant past thing. The people who are the survivors of those massacres are still talking about it and what ought to be done. You know, so there's this, we need to tell the truth about this terrible past that's a collective past, putting aside the scientifically proven fact that we've been here for about 65,000 years. Putting that aside, the last 234 years of the colonial project have been devastating to us. They've wrecked us in time, and we need to fix that. And one way of doing that is a truth-telling process and fess up to that. And the next point is to go forward and how do we do that. We don't do it by denying what's happened in the last 234 years. Teela, do you see the truth-telling and... Um the process of, of healing um, as an important part of the, the treaty, treaty process? I do, yes. Um, but I think that the responsibility of truth-telling shouldn't always be on black fellas. No. Um, I think that non-Indigenous Australia have a huge role um, to front up to the truth of this country um, I think that it has to be an ongoing dialogue between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people about um, the reality and the truth of our history. Um, as has been said, the foundation of this country and the institutions that are built within this country have been formed in a framework from the Constitution. We know that. Um, and it's been formed on the exclusion um, of the participation of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I think that um, we have to address these fundamental dilemmas before we can engage in a bigger conversation um, around truth-telling. I think, personally, truth-telling is status quo unless we address structural issues such as voice and treaty. Um, I feel that there is a risk um, with if we were to pursue treaties across the country without uh, having an equal obligation to listen and to hear our communities, there is a risk of entrenching further imbalance of power between the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. So, for example, um, the way in which the reforms were issued to the Australian people through the Uluru Statement from the Heart was to first entrench a First Nations voice that would enable a Makarrata Commission to establish treaty and truth-telling processes. Because we know through that process that was of course designed by Professor Megan Davis, the 13 dialogues that culminated in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, there was lots of truth-telling within these forums. I personally was a working group leader on Section 5126, 
And what had to happen was on each of the days um, at the beginning of each dialogue where people spoke about the massacres, our elders got up and poured their hearts out um, and were really frustrated and ventilated um, that they are constantly telling the truth in their local communities. They are constantly speaking truth. But what's not happening is there's no structural change that's flowing from this heartbreak that people are feeling. And there's very little accountability for when we speak the truth um, on what happens back in our community. So for example, compensation um, that must flow or reparations that must flow from the truth that has happened in this history are things that I think we honestly have to grapple with as a nation. They're gonna be difficult conversations but unless we deal with these foundational dilemmas such as voice and treaty, we are going to be stuck. Um, we're going to be a nation stuck in time and not being able to build a future for all children. Helen, this is an interesting point that Teela raises because truth-telling is one part of it and the process of that is cathartic. But how damaging is it for us as a people and as individuals to express ourselves and express the trauma that we've been through? Um, for it to fall on deaf ears and for no action to be taken. Just how damaging is that? Can you give us an idea? I think that's actually the point, isn't it? Is um, if truth-telling actually isn't heard, if no one's actually listening, and by listening, I mean actually listening with the whole heart, the whole person, the whole spirit, the whole nation, then, then what happens to that truth-telling? It becomes re-traumatising for communities to have to tell their story over and over and over again. I think one of the things that uh, really um, was really significant for me, particularly as a, as a clinician having worked for many, many years with a variety of very traumatised families and communities, um, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, um, with the Royal Commission uh, that I was on, was that the, it wasn't just truth-telling, it was true bearing of witness. And bearing of witness is about making known what has happened. And, and doing something with those stories and having those stories have value and meaning and purpose so that people can then participate in a process going forward. And, and I think that's what we have to remember, that just the retelling of stories for no actual purpose is damaging. But the telling of stories for the purpose of understanding, of validating, of believing, of giving people a process and a, and a, a healing journey forward it, it, it is a good thing. And certainly the I think some of the people that came to us, and I, I have to really thank everybody who came to the, to the Royal Commission and shared their stories under great duress and, and great courage. Um, some, some of them described it as a pivotal moment. It was a very, very powerful process in their lives because of the, of the way it was done. I, I don't think we can keep expecting people to tell these incredibly traumatic and generational stories without an outcome. That's just going to create more harm. So we have to be very careful about the way we I guess an important part of getting an outcome is being engaged in the political system. Can we talk a little bit about the voice to parliament uh, with respect to that? How would we build and promote engagement at the grassroots level to make sure that whatever solution we come up with as a nation, people are talking about it and engaging with it, uh, but we're also able to engage at the political level as well. Nick, you've got a lot of experience in this, in this area. Um, uh, perhaps we're getting too consumed with the idea of a voice. I'm oh, sorry, I'm holding my chest, but I've got some nerve problems and it annoys me every now and again. Um, and maybe that's not the proper route to go down. Um, maybe the self-government route is the way to go. Um, trying to adapt or emulate the process in British Columbia where First Nations negotiate treaties as First Nations government. Um, it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to be a long game um, but I don't see why that sort of process adapted to Northern Territory conditions wouldn't work in the Northern Territory. So your objective is Aboriginal self-government. Uh, in the Northern Territory, we do not have a contest with government 
about sovereignty, they say and agree and have signed up for an MAU that say, I know they're not a pussel, but at least there's an agreement that Aboriginal people in Northern Territory have never ceded their sovereignty. Um, there's an acceptance that we were there for thousands of years, uh, running our own government under our own laws and customs. Um, and that um, uh, a treaty process should, uh, as a key objective, be, uh, uh, be beneficial. Um, a lot of people have been saying to me that the local decision-making processes that the Northern Territory Government have implemented all the morph into self-government. Now, people are going to get ready for that, and they've realised this in British Columbia as well, uh, that it can take decades mm. to get ready to sit across the table with government and negotiate a government-to-government -government treaty. Um, so if you get to that stage, why would you need a voice to their parliament when you're talking to them as government-to-government? -government? So do you see engaging with... Um those sorts of political systems, governments, whatnot, as, as the biggest hurdle in... I don't think the, the, the problem isn't so much agreeing to um, Aboriginal government or Torres Strait Islander government. I mean, we're almost there with Torres Straits um, as the regional authority approach, and then maybe it has to be phased and stepped in. Um, but eventually... It becomes an argument or a negotiation, more accurately, about jurisdiction. Um, not about who's got sovereignty, not about who hasn't got sovereignty, not about who, who in reserve. It's about who's going to share power and how. And, uh, you know, the indication over the billions of... any um, big and light um, indigenous people governing themselves uh, do a shitload better on closing the gap than white fella driven public policy and practice. The evidence is overwhelming. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. We do a better job if we're allowed to do it. That's the evidence overseas. And that's the evidence in some parts of Australia. The data is mounting. You know, Aboriginal control. Some Ab Indigenous control health organisations in this country are actually, you can see the data are shifting life expectancy upwards for their clientele. White fellas have never done that. You know, people dealing with their own affairs is the way to move those affairs not some outsider telling you how to do it. And it doesn't threaten the nation state. It doesn't threaten the um, Federation of Canada, for example, or the United States, where you've got First Nations governing themselves all over the place, running their own affairs, being their own government, providing their own service, and the rest of it goes along with government. I mean, you guys have had, you know, white fellas have had 234 years. And what we're left with is bloody wreckage. <laughs> Give us a go at it. Get out of the way. We support it, but get out of the way. We can do a better job than you can, and we can prove it. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we've seen similar outcomes in education as well with, um, with around those sorts of statistics. Teela... Sovereignty used to be a discussion that sort of happened on the fringes or as something that was like an alternative or radical idea. Um, but it seems as though it's sort of creeping more into um, mainstream discussion. Is that what you've seen as well? Um, look, I certainly think mob um, have always spoken about their sovereignty never being ceded. Um, it's a difficult conversation to get into because it's a complex term that means different things to different people. It's a socio-political and legal concept. So I'm not going to get into that, that kind of conversation right now because we'll probably need a whole day to talk about it. But absolutely, um, 
the foundational issue of this country is that no First Nations community has ever ceded their sovereignty. Um, and back to the issue of a voice or self-government or a voice through parliament, whatever you would like to call it, um, the way in which we set this up and have to establish it does require institutional change. It requires legal and political institutional change. It's about power. With respect to engaging in processes such as treaty and truth-telling, we need a conversation that's going to begin at a starting point that happens in good faith. One of the things that we've been unable to, to do consistently um, in this country is to get governments to listen to our communities. Um, with respect to a voice, the mandate within the Uluru Statement is to establish a representative body. Now, that is not a threat to anyone or any institution in this country. It's an indeed a gift a gift that speaks to over 60,000 years of history, of languages and of stories. I think what we need is, is non-Aboriginal Australia to understand its responsibility in lifting this country up to, uh, to achieve that. And the strategy within the Uluru Statement was co the correct one. The strategy to issue it to the people was indeed the right one because we need that people power to, to create the institutional change. Now back to um, the, the issue of, of sovereignty. Um, I mean, next year is 2020, right? Next year we're supposed to be celebrating the commemoration of, of Cook. I think that we need to build a resistance around that. In terms of commemorating that, this is not um, going to be, it, it should not be framed as a happy conversation. For many of our communities um, across the country, um, the invasion has um, destroyed many of these communities. What I witnessed as I've traveled, particularly in the last two years, is lots of different nations have different leverages to begin to, at, as a starting point, to engage in, for example, treaty. So we have a process that's happening in the NT, we've got um, a process that's happening in Victoria. Um, one of the many things that you'll begin to witness is the over 250 nations across the country have different resources and different capacities to sit down and have that conversation. The one thing that I think is the most selfless opportunity within the Uluru Statement is that, hey, mob said, Let's sit down, let's recognise all of our voices and all of our nations, not just the ones that are the loudest or, or where government is ready to sit at the table, but ones where they can build capacity and each of the nations are able to be recognised in this representative body. And that's what I see as the mandate in moving as a first step with the voice and then engaging in the Makarata Commission. Of course, the voice is not the solution to everything, but it is a starting point to having an honest powerful conversation based on equity. Can we um, pivot for a moment and talk about um, one of the strategies that's been employed by the federal government to close the gap targets? Um, because that's one of the frameworks that we're working within now as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as you know, a, a way to sort of improve lives and you know, a bunch of policies that work within that. And I'd like to particularly talk to you about it, Helen, because I know that you know, your knowledge of this area is, is vast. Um, how are we tracking and where do you think, um, based on your sort of expert knowledge, where do you think we need to throw extra support or, um, or move our focus to? Hmm. Look, I, I have to admit I'm, I'm, I'm not really close to closing the gap at the moment, having been sort of away from that area for some years. But when, we, uh, when I was involved initially in the sort of the close the gap targets, what, what seemed to be missing from the conversation was the whole issue around mental health and social emotional wellbeing. And there were no targets in that area. Um, if you just take one target or a couple of targets, for example, around education, 
I think it's, it's really important that our, that our kids do get a good education. It's one of the great levelers in society that everyone can engage in, in education and set up a, a, a career for life. That's, that's a great thing. Um, but if you, if you look at something like attendance or achievement for Aboriginal kids at school, then what we found with um, one, some of the research we did some years ago, and that's a little bit old, but it's, it's still relevant uh, from the WA Aboriginal Child Health Survey, was that some of the factors that impacted on whether a child could attend and achieve at school was their level of social and emotional difficulty that they had. And then if you look at what, what was driving those difficulties, it was about all of the adverse life stress events that children were experiencing. So if you just take a simple target of, the, of attendance at school and you don't understand all of the things that lie beneath that, then what is the target actually doing and how are we going to achieve it? Because you might end up taking a very simplistic and unsophisticated approach to getting kids to attend and they're not going to achieve because you haven't addressed all of these other historical, uh, traumatic um, and family and community issues that underlie that, that, that point. And I think we failed to grapple with mental we failed to grapple with mental health back then, and I think we're still failing to grapple with mental health now. If you look at sort of the current emphasis, uh, there there is more things around perhaps culture and um, things like overrepresentation in juvenile justice, and issues around child removal. But again, all of the issues that underlie that are all of the historical issues and the intergenerational trauma that we're still grappling with that we don't know how to deal with. So I think what the problem I see is that. First of all, we've never understood the critical value and importance of Indigenous culture and what we bring to the knowledge base for all of us, all of the world, but especially Australia. We haven't understood the magnitude of the historical trauma that we've experienced, not, not even come close to understanding the magnitude. What we've then done is we've moved straight into reconciliation, but we don't know what we're reconciling because we haven't actually looked at the history. And then we've thrown programs without understanding what was required for the community in their stage of healing. Some communities I've worked with don't really even know some of their histories. They're not fully informed either because we mm. haven't actually taught it in schools. We still haven't got to that point where we have, I know we have standards around Indigenous curriculum but we haven't really sort of looked at how well that's taught or, or what, what consistent standards we're achieving. If you look at schools even, I mean, how many schools teach Indigenous languages? Does anybody know? I suspect it's probably still easier to learn French. Mm, I would imagine so, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, I would imagine so, definitely. Then um, perhaps an Aboriginal language. So, so we're sometimes putting the cart before the horse, I think, and trying to achieve these targets without understanding what all of the steps are that are necessary in order to get there. And I think that's what we really should be doing. Mick, when we talk about uh, broader structural change like um, treaty processes, constitutional recognition, broader ideas, and then you know you hear about um, how we're tracking against close the gap targets. You've been in working in the space for a very long time, and I imagine it's incredibly frustrating to to see priorities triaged constantly and, and to be putting out fires rather than dealing with the root cause of what some of these problems are. How do you think we overcome that? And do you think that there is enough political will and public engagement and public support for us to work on both, uh, both strategies simultaneously? Putting out spot fires, but also you know, maybe doing some backburning to prevent fires in the future. To use that analogy. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, the problem's structural. Not entirely, but um, it's a big component of why we seemingly don't make progress on what seem to be intractable outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I so say it's structural because it's it's still is and primarily has been a top down approach to telling you know, Indigenous Australians um, what's best for us. Um, and it operates within institutions, which includes parliaments. Um, that think they know better. 
the thinking has to change and there's a lot of resistance. Look at the resistance to the idea of a voice. Um, so maybe there's another way of, of approaching that. Where we, I'm not saying we ignore the constitution and law, um, but we look at structures and say, well, this, what you're doing isn't working. How can we make that work? And I think it might it work by two, adopting two simple um, approaches in Indigenous Affairs policy. Um, one is um, adopt a policy of self-determination and all that that entails. This is the policy of the Victorian um, Parliament, Victorian Government. Uh, it's the policy for the whole of the United States, for Native Americans. Um, and it was adopted in 19... 70s, mid 1970s, by Richard Nixon, of all people. Uh, and the, the Indigenous people felt if that's the policy, we're going to take it and run with it. And they have. They haven't had to change the constitution there. Similarly in Canada. <laughs> they haven't had to have to have a voice to Parliament, but those two jurisdictions have long standing Indigenous voice the, the, uh, the National Congress of Maritime Indians and the um, First Nations Assembly in Canada. Um, but on, a, on the ground, they have the jurisdiction, they have the power to make decisions. That's why we have a Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The two primary things about, uh, components of about, that deal with power and how you exercise it in jurisdiction are the Indigenous Peoples' right to self-determination and the golden thread that runs through it, our right to free, prior and informed consent. If we adapted, if we supported those things as a nation, I don't see why you need to, you might have to tinker with some legislative stuff, but I, I don't see why you have to mess around with constitutional change or constitutional increasing, whatever. Because the end result is you're going to be running your own government and doing things the way your people tell you to do them. Not Canberra or Melbourne or Sydney or Darwin. You know, that's the, the, <coughs> the constant feedback I'm getting uh, in the Northern Territory. It says, we don't want someone in Canberra making decisions about us. We don't want interventions. No, we don't want the Darwin mob telling us what to do on our country. It's a very localised view mm. how they want to do things. And I think they'll do it better. And some of them are already proving they're doing better because of their getting to make the decisions. I mean, the best thing, best thing in, about having a good life, I think, is you and your group, your family, your extended community, your First Nations group, making the decision about the things that most affect their lives. Not some conference like this or mm. some health conference or education conference or some legislative assembly or some national parliament. They really don't have a clue what's going on on the ground because they don't bother to look. They put, you know, a big closing the gap policy purportedly approved by and consented to by Indigenous people. Mm. People on the ground have got no bloody idea what closing the gap is because they were never asked about it. They yeah. might, not, might, may not want to choose that. If my initial consultation is there's any indication, they bloody won't. They'll throw it out and say we want our own way of dealing with these things. And why shouldn't they have the right to deal with those things themselves without outside interference? Manipulation, bribes, blackmail, division causing, unsettling people. Because that's the colonial project. 
He hasn't completed yet. He wants to complete its work. And that means to obliterate us. Mm. And our systems of looking after ourselves are gulling ourselves. <coughs> when you describe it like that, it sounds like, or it feels like we're in a, a codependent relationship with our government. We're not, a we're not even, co I mean, we're not, <laughs> you know? we're totally dependent. Because no, that's I, what colonialism does to Yeah, you. no, I, I mean more <coughs> in the sense that, um, you know, they're, they're like a helicopter parent. They won't just sort of let us do our own thing rather than, um, you know, try to control I, I actually everything. don't know what they're scared of. I, I really don't know what they're scared of. Because when you think about some of the innovations that have come from our mob, we, we lead the world in primary health care in terms of models. Uh, our traditional healers have no exclusion criteria. Wouldn't that be a great service? Imagine that. <laughs> you know, you know we, we have led the way in so many things. I just don't know what we're afraid and of. Can I just end on Close the Gap, just by Absolutely. way of comment on two issues? Um, I agree the issue is structural um, on the one hand. I think that the project that has been Close the Gap for Parliament has also been an excuse for them to do nothing. In many ways, um, Close the Gap is not closing at all. And the structural issue comes back to the fact that communities on the ground have very little power over impacting on these decisions that are made in Canberra. People want to be able to influence policy from their communities for longevity, for cycles that are more than the political cycle beyond three, six year term. Mob want to be able to have a say on policy that affects their communities longer than Parliament is able to play football with our lives. And I think the structural issues um, are important in terms of leveraging power from within communities to influence Parliament. And I do think voice and treaty are not mutually exclusive, but can empower communities and the nation. And I think that um, building this uh, partnership or relationship and resetting that, that relationship between all the Australian people is really important in closing the gap or whatever you want to call it. But, but enabling black fellas to live a life that is self-determining is what's most important. Mm. We're going to move on to questions from the audience now. Um, this one is from Elle, and I'll direct it to all of you, any and all of you. Um, how do you respond to people who cannot accept truths about our past, who refuse to listen to Aboriginal voices, people who are akin to Holocaust deniers? I guess it sort of speaks to um, what we were saying earlier about Truth-telling is one part of it, and then truth-hearing is, is the other. Okay, right, I'll... Then, oh, sorry. sorry, you, you go on. Yeah. No, you go first. Okay. Um, what, what's our... What's our uh, look, I really hate to make this comparison, but I'm just going to. Um, what, what's our motto for Anzac Day? Lest we forget... Why don't we apply that to what happened to us? Um, one of the big issues around trauma, of course, is trauma never actually goes away. It finds a way of coming back to the surface until it's dealt with. And we know that both from evidence, we know that both from, we don't know it also from people's personal stories. Um, so it will find a way to come back to the surface unless we actually create a process where we can have healing uh, for all of us as a nation, N not just for our communities, but for all of us as a nation, we've, we've got to come together and, and reconcile the past and move forward to a positive um, future for all of our children. And we have a wonderful country and a wonderful nation, so we, we've got to do that. And I, I think that we, we just have to be open and honest and be prepared to accept um, what did happen and move forward. Th this, is, this is not really about blame anymore. It's about saying we have to understand the impact um, and what happened so that we can actually move forward in a positive way. It won't go away. It, it's not going to go away. It's ever present with us as we move forward into the future. So to deny it is just going to push it away a little bit further, but it will come back. 
the other issue about um, truth telling and the bearing, the true bearing of witness, is that we don't want this to ever be repeated again. And how do we know that some of the things that happen today aren't repeated cycles from the past? For example, the high rates of removal of our children into both foster care and into juvenile justice facilities. Uh, how do we know that that's not recycling the past if we don't understand what happened? Yeah, the truth telling process has to be also a component of it is education awareness raising. Um, you know, I went to primary school during the 1950s, I went to high school during the 1960s. Um, nothing was taught about Aboriginal history and what happened. And we've got to be mature enough to face the horrible stuff of our past. We can't just draw a line in the sand and say, well, that's over, let's start. Let's start afresh. We've got to deal with the past. Um, there's redress to be made. And we're not going to be happy unless it's made. That's what, if you talk, want to talk about reconciliation, we're not going to have it without acknowledging the past and getting some redress of the past. Mm. It's important for both sides, isn't it? I mean, mm. it's a heavy burden to carry as a white Australian um, to know that you're the beneficiary of some, um, you know, some pretty horrible things that have happened to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people without dealing with it properly. Um, Teela, this one's for you. How can non-Indigenous Australians best support your work in advocating for the Uluru Statement from the heart? And I'm going to roll it in with this other question here, which says, why has progress stalled and how do we reinvigorate it? Um, I don't think progress has stalled on this issue. Uh, law reform is certainly not easy and it's not easy in a country that lives in denial. Um, it, and I say that um, because I do think there is a great silence from the Prime Minister on this issue. I do think that his silence should not be mistaken for not understanding the urgency of the reforms within the Uluru Statement. Um, people are joining the movement. We have to be assured that this has been two years of just purely people, general uh, uh, Australians talking about the issues. And within two years, despite Prime Ministers either one, dismissing it, like Turnbull did, or two, just being completely silent, like Morrison is, it's the people that continue to put this issue on the agenda. I mean, we're talking about it now. It's a human rights issue that we need to grapple with. Um, it, the Uluru Statement is the blueprint to creating a better future. Um, with respect to what non-Aboriginal people can do, you need to just start to be activists in your own community. You need to tell the truth. You need to um, call out um, lies within your community. You need to create uh, communities and cells within your reading clubs or whatever um, that continues to build the discussion, like build the conversation and build the discussion around the importance of redress or, or reconciliation. I prefer the term reckoning. Um, we need to reckon with our past. Uh, people can join on onevoiceuluru.org. You can sign up um, and, and donate. Like this has to be a people powered movement that needs resources. Thank you. Um, this one is to Mick. What are the key lessons you've learned from your time as NT Treaty Commissioner? And how can we apply some of those lessons in other states and territories in Australia? I've only been there since March. <laughs> <laughs> Quick it's, learner. It's a, short, <laughs> a very short period of time. Um, one of the things I've learned is this is a long game. It ain't going to happen in a hurry. Um, and people have to set themselves for it. You know, that it, it eventually it might be um, your grandkids who are signing off on the treaties. Because um, we've got a lot to do on both sides of the, of the table, including getting treaty ready. I don't think there's anyone in the Northern Territory, any single First Nation group, that you could say, well, they're ready to start negotiations for a treaty tomorrow. 
um, and the experiences in British Columbia that he's previously taken yeah, between 18 and 25 years. Um, and I think the Victorians are doing a good thing by allowing 16-year-olds to vote for their First Nations Assembly because those 16-year-olds might be signing off on the treaties two decades from now. But it's a long game, we've got to accept that. And, you know, Prime Ministers come and go, State Premiers, Chief Ministers come and go. Um, we're not going anywhere, and neither is our legitimate grievances, and we will demand that they be dealt with at some stage. I'd like to ask the final question, if that's okay, and it is further to what you're just speaking about. Um, how do we maintain not only uh, political pressure but public interest and public support for long campaigns? And essentially that's sort of what they are, these um, pushes for, for rights. How do we maintain um, people's interest in our issues, in support for our issues, when those campaigns do take such a long time and those processes do take such a long time? I mean, even in 1967, that took, you know, 10 to 15 years for them to push um, for that. Well, we've been struggling for 234 years. It's a transgenerational thing. There's justice and fairness and enjoyment of human rights. Um, it's hard work. Um, and the... Um, commitment that my great-grandparents have, have had has been passed down to generations. And I'm sure it'll go down the next generation as to all of the panels to us. And all the, all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room in New South Wales, in Australia, um, eventually will win, even if it takes another 200 years. The, the Grievances, as I say, are totally le legitimate and they need to be addressed. Would either of you like to add anything to that? I just think the one thing our people don't have is time. It's been a hard slog for many of our elders and leaders and I don't want this generation to be the generation that leaves the hard work to the next generation. And I think in order for us to be able to achieve the hard work is we can't turn away from that difficult conversation. Um, whether it's the long ongoing execution and engagement within treaties or whether it's forcing our parliament to put a voice to a referendum on the table I think people have to understand that they have the capacity and individual power to achieve this. Because for so long, parliaments have not acted in the interest of, of the people or indeed First Nations. Um, and I do think that we have to go on a self-education process. Many people around the country don't even know how this system of law works. It's complex. Um, and I think that many underestimate what we can achieve if we were all focused on, on the same goal. I'm going to say stand up, speak up, walk with us and let's achieve it together. I think that that is an excellent place to leave the discussion. Very big thank you to Professor Mick Dodson, Teela Reid, and Professor Helen Milroy. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>